I thought I'd go ahead. <clears throat> hey, everybody, Dale Wisely. Well, I say everybody. I'm not sure anybody's even out there yet, but I uh, thought I'd go ahead and go live here about four minutes early just to give uh, folks a chance to get the notification if they're on Facebook and come over and join us. So I'm just going to kind of hem haw here for a minute. Hi, Debbie. If you're, uh, as you come in, if you want to just uh, com put a comment in so I know you're here, just say hello or hey there, Uncle Dale or whatever. I'm looking to screen something that would really be handy. And I don't know where it is. It's kind of a count of who's joined us. I just don't see that anywhere. Maybe they don't want us to know. You're welcome, Debbie. Glad to do it. Just trying to be useful. Like Sherry may be with us. Hey, Sherry. So we're doing well here at Wisely Manor. Um, really have not left the house in a while and uh, kind of glad. We took a shipped order yesterday and first time I've ever done that. That worked out well. And We've been able to see our grandkids a few times from a safe social distance. They've been over to play in the backyard a couple times, and we get to look out the window and talk to them through the screen door. And Got a daughter here in town. That's who I just talked about. They seem to be doing okay. They're dealing with the usual stuff about trying to work at home and homeschool kids and um, got a daughter in San Francisco. She and her husband are doing well. They were in England when things started to kind of crack down and travel back to the United States became difficult, but they made it back. They've been in shelter in place out in San Francisco for a while. Seems like about two weeks, maybe. We have a daughter in Nashville and uh, she's still working. It's just an amazing thing. She's got a job where even under normal circumstances, she spends a lot of time working at home. And so it just kind of converted that. And uh, so that's worked out well. I see some people coming on board here. Wait a couple more minutes and might start about 7.32. Give everybody a chance. Hey, Chrissy. You know, I was saying uh, to somebody earlier today, I've um, been teaching a seminar that I normally do in person. It's normally a weekend seminar for Spring Hill. I've been doing it for 25 years. And I had to do that one, did that one through Google Meet, that platform. And then I've got other things I'm doing with Zoom. There's that platform. And there's Facebook Live, this platform. And Kind of makes it hard to keep up with all those way too many technologies, I guess. If you're tuning in to us, we're just stalling for a minute. I want to go ahead and connect and let everybody get a chance to get the notification that the event's about to start and give them a chance to connect. And I'm just here making small talk. Yeah. Hope everybody's doing well. Whatever, you know, stands for doing well in this day and age. I don't think anybody knows what doing well means, but everything's different.
Hey, Sister Judith. Good to see you. Hello, Donna. And hey, Vicki. Hey, Candy. <laughs> Candy and I go way back, like the early 70s. <laughs> oh, man. Since I don't see a place on my screen to have uh, to know who's how many people we have online, if you would, if you're tuned in, just enter a chat and say hey. <laughs> Margaret says that she wakes up every morning and checks herself for symptoms. Man, don't we all? I have. Uh, allergies like a lot of us do seasonal allergies pollen count's been really high the best thing i've seen about this you know you have to keep your sense of humor where somebody said that if you suffer from allergies at the same time this is going on about two or three times a day you kind of ask yourself am i about to you cough you know whatever and you say am i about to go to the hospital or do i just need to take a claritin <laughs> so it's a good thing I'm not in public very much because every time I clear my throat or cough a little bit, I feel like I need to explain myself to everybody around me. Hey, Joe, Kim, 48 of us are here, I see. That's good. I think it must be Jill Let me know. Okay, it's 732. This will be recorded, so um, I think we can go ahead and start. And... Um, well, wow, sure hope everybody's hanging in there and doing well. Um, I, I, as I said last time, I did a live event. I don't, uh, I don't often try to speak for everybody on the staff at Prince of Peace and the parish and school, but I know I do when I say we are uh, thinking of all of you and remembering you in our prayers, and also trying to make sure that you know that we're doing everything we can to be helpful and to kind of keep you connected to the parish. Um, hats off, I tell you, to all of our teachers down at the school who are just getting great reviews for the things they're doing for our students, you know, to keep their education going. And just as important, if not more important, than their education is just maintaining that connection, you know, and making sure they know that they're loved and cared for and aren't forgotten. and so just uh, tremendous work. Um, we have to add teachers to this massive list of people in our community and the whole country that are doing amazing things, often putting themselves at terrible risk to serve the rest of us. That's the inspiring thing in all this. You know, I keep thinking about uh, all the doctors and nurses who deservedly are getting lots and lots of credit for putting themselves at risk and but also think about people who clean hospitals and pick up our garbage and work in grocery stores and home health care workers and all kinds of people out there that are uh, being heroic and sometimes heroic being paid minimum wage so anyway it's amazing time so anyway at prince of peace let us know if you can if we can help you you know um um you can reach any of us by email, go to the Prince of Peace website, scroll down to the bottom, you'll see the staff and everything they do and uh, email us if there's anything that you know that we can do for you and we'll see what we can uh, do. And if you are, particularly if you need just to have us thinking about you and praying for you, uh, let us know. Also, don't forget we're uh, live streaming mass, daily mass at 8.30 and Sunday mass at 8.30 we've got a, Holy Week schedule coming up. Check that out. It's on the Facebook page. All right, I'm going to make a couple of comments, by the way. And um, as uh, I'm going to try to watch this chat thing um, in case somebody asks me a question. I'll tell you what, um, Jill, if you're on, uh, I think you are, um, if you'll kind of keep an eye on that for me. And if you see a question you think, uh, particularly notable. Maybe you could text it to me and because uh, I may, I could easily miss it just trying to divide my attention here. But let me just make a couple of comments to start off with and I want to go through a few things. And the, I, I put some, I did get some questions by email 
uh, and other means. And so I've just tried to go ahead and incorporate some of those questions <clears throat> into some comments I'm going to make. Uh, and again, I need to start with a question, I mean, with a statement of full humility in the sense that, um, well, you turn, you know, I, I've been around long enough as a psychologist that I've gotten pretty comfortable with sharing my opinions about kids and families and so forth. And But uh, this is a time where we have to acknowledge that uh, we're all having to figure this out as we go, including psychologists and counselors and teachers and mental health people because it's, it's unprecedented. The last time we had something like this, uh, you know, a massive uh, pandemic was a hundred years ago where for all practical purposes, there were no psychologists and counselors and so forth. And um, so none of us come into this with any real experience and none of us come into it with any data to speak of. And so we're just having to do the best we can. And I also should say, uh, uh, before I start dispensing advice, if I'm going to do that, you know, I'm very conscious of the fact that I do not have any children at my house right now. Uh, right now, I'm uh, right now. I'm not worried about, you know, being able to stay on the payroll here and there. So um, uh, uh, I'm really thinking about all of you who are trying to um, look after your kids, try to keep them educated, try to work from home or not being not working and worried about sick people and having sick people you have to do you know i just uh, i'm just conscious right now how blessed uh, um, i am uh, uh, and my family is okay so a couple things to think about um as we go through this i continue to be concerned about the um youth safety aspect of all of this um so um Domestic violence and uh, child abuse um, is always a problem, obviously. And you just have to think that that's not, you have to think that's accelerating right now because of everybody being closed up, everybody being, uh, you know, stressed out, so many people being stressed out. And you just have to think that we're seeing spikes in uh, maltreatment. And you know, when I talk about child abuse, that's an awfully heavy word. And um, uh, I, we, you know, define child abuse the way you want to. I'm also just thinking about, we're in a situation where we're really in danger of yelling at our kids in a way we just normally wouldn't, you know, that kind of verbal stuff. And, um, but you know, there are a lot of households out there that are, have difficulties on the best day and you have to worry about those kids. Also, you know, the reality of it is kids with all the worries we have about things like school shootings, kids are safer in school than they are in, at home or better way of putting it. They're safer when they're in school than when they're not in school. Uh, just like when uh, in, at a pediatric hospital, you know, the emergency rooms are very busy in the summer because that's when kids tend to get hurt um, weekends and summers when they're not in school. And I think I mentioned this in our last thing, but I just want to keep emphasizing this. If you have teenagers, uh, it's really a time to be thinking, keeping up with them even more than you normally would. Um, recall that teenage depression already a big problem. Teenage suicide rates have been soaring in the last you know, 10 years. Uh, way before all this started, and we don't know yet how um, suicide rates are going to change as a result of all this, but we need to be particularly mindful of this, especially if you have kids that you know already have emotional or mental health vulnerabilities, they need to be keeping up with them. And then the last thing I'm just going to say about safety is that, you know, i got this thing about motor vehicle crashes and teenagers uh, always more dangerous in the summer. We call those the hundred deadliest days for teenagers because it's the time they're more likely to die in, because of unintentional injuries, motor vehicle crashes, and so forth. And so we're basically looking at what a five month summer. And um, so be mindful of that. I'm in the process of recording my talk I've been giving for 20 years on parenting the teenage driver. And when I get that finished up, I'll share it on this page for you to take a look at. So let's keep that safety thing in mind. It's uh, 
and they and I think I know I mentioned this in the last last video. You know, not a particularly good time for a kid to get hurt in any way. Out on their skateboards, out on their scooters, out, you know, a lot of kids out there now around and playing. And man, it's not a good time to get injured and have to roll into a hospital. Um, if you have to, you have to. Um, let me just quickly check this thing. I was just checking to see if there's a question I needed. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some of these general things. And uh, I'm also going to point you to some resources uh, before we wind up. So a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. Um, and this is about a disease. And it's also about the economic fallout of the disease. Um, it can be overwhelming. Um, and it can bring out all kinds of very strong emotions in all of us, including our, in our families, our the adults and the kids and the teenagers. And so um, we have to do what we can to cope with the stress and we'll never get this right. Um, no matter how well we're doing, we'll have our break uh, out moments or breakthrough moments. I don't know what I'm trying to say, where our uh, coping uh, that seems to be going so well, we just have a bad day and we don't cope so well. So we're uh, we can't get perfect on this, but we just need to tr do our best. So we may be experiencing fear and worry about our health, um, about the health of people we know and love. And uh, we may be experiencing changes in sleep um, and eating patterns. That's often related to stress. Uh, may have trouble uh, concentrating. Uh, I've noticed I, I'm doing OK, but I've had a little I love to read. Um, but I'm trying to read like six books at once. And I think it's because I can't quite focus on one long enough, you know. So uh, I've been a little notice myself being a little scattered myself. Um, we might have uh, if you have chronic health problems, uh, health problems, you know, tend to get worse when we're under stress. And so uh, any kind of medical condition that we deal with or your kids deal with those symptoms, it flare up just because of the stress involved in all this. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Madeline. Um, and so uh, I also have been thinking a lot about uh, people, our families who already, again, before all this happened, were having to live in, in their homes with people who have significant psychological problems or behavioral problems, maybe their children or spouses or family members. And um, often, um, people in that situation have some kind of respite, you know, where maybe if you have a family member that has a serious psychiatric disorder, maybe during the day they had some place they could go, a program, and that, that's very likely closed down right now. So I just say all that because I, I just, I, I always am thinking about the families who are already in a very vulnerable, stressful situation before all this began. Uh, could be a lot of increased use of substances during this time. I, I've read several times that alcohol sales are spiking. Um, people probably smoking more, uh, maybe a tendency to use other drugs. If you have a teenager in the house, you might tell them that irrespective of what uh, we normally say or worry about smoking marijuana, really bad time to be smoking pot. I just read some stuff today that uh, if you're a pot smoker uh, and you happen to uh, develop the vaccine, I'm, I'm sorry, develop the virus, that it would make you more vulnerable to get really sick. Um, I suspect that's also true of people who smoke cigarettes. So another thing is to think about is all of us are going to react to these stressful situations in different ways. Everybody has a different story. And a lot of that will have to do with our background. The things that make you different from other people will make you different in the way you react to all this. Maybe the community you live in, the amount of support that you have. Um, so, um, you know, at this time, the people you would expect to be particularly prone to stress would be older people and people with chronic illnesses, the people who know. Um, that they are more at higher risk for developing severe illness if they get COVID-19. Tough time for kids and teens because their, you know, lives are turned upside down and school is more or less gone. And school, you know, can be a tremendous amount of support and social support and other kinds of support for kids. And that's kicked out, kicked out from under right now. And 
not to mention, you know, the seniors and people that people play sp spring sports and that all these things taken away from. Them. And then, of course, you know, our doctors, our nurses, all our healthcare care people, the people that have to go to work to take care of the rest of us and make sure our needs get met, um, would expect them to be uh, stressed out. So we need to try to take care of ourselves. Nobody, you'll never catch me saying this is easy, but uh, just a couple of pointers. And these are things you probably have run into, but it wouldn't hurt to go over again. I think we, uh, one of the most common pieces of advice I've seen out there is that we need to be careful about not overdosing on TV news coverage. Um, you know, we need to take breaks from that and uh, be willing to walk away from it and, um, uh, limit our time on that um, because it can certainly uh, increase our anxiety and our anger. Uh, same with social media. We need to be a little bit careful about that. Just be always evaluating whether our um, our use of social media is a, is a source of support for us, maybe a chance to vent, to make connections versus just a place to be kind of angry and <laughs> you know, frustrated and so forth. So we need to kind of always be evaluating that. Uh, we need to try to take care of ourselves physically. So we need to take time to, you know, settle ourselves and take deep breaths and stretch and, um, you know, eat, uh, eat as well as we can and uh, exercise. You know, uh, with kids, um, this kind of stems from uh, the research on ADHD. Um, it's very well documented that kids um, with ADHD benefit from being outside uh, and exercising. Any kind of movement seems to really help with ADHD. And I think to some extent that's just generally true. The kids, <clears throat> we need to really push our kids to spend some time in the backyard. If we're lucky enough to have a backyard, try to keep them moving and um, push that, make that even a disciplinary issue. Uh, in the sense that maybe you have to kind of reward, uh, allow them some time to do the sedentary things they want to do, like on the computer, uh, only after they've done X amount of time being outside, moving around uh, and exercising. So it's a good time to link those together. If your child, if you find your kid just wants to sit around and play video games or whatever, withhold that and hold it hostage. <laughs> until they spend X amount of time exercising, X amount of time being outside. You know, you got to connect those things together. Um, we need to all just try to find little moments where we can kind of just relax and chill out. And again, easier said than done. So many of us are overwhelmed. We've got to continue to try to find ways to connect with each other. And, you know, that's the wonderful thing about the, all the technology that's available to us now that that just wasn't true not so long ago. So uh, families can, you know, have Skype and uh, FaceTime and Zoom conversations. Friends can connect that way. It's very important. Uh, so I want to um, talk about just a couple of um, of resources. And um, with part of this is keeping in mind that um, this could certainly be a time when families encounter some real um, crises um, in, 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 in their families. Um, somewhat, this is a time when sir, anybody at any time can develop something like a serious depression, including children. And we have to assume that the risk of all that are, are kind of elevated right now. So, um, we also have to be thinking about domestic violence. I mentioned child abuse earlier. All kinds of domestic violence are um, in the mix here. Uh, and a lot of people have commented about that. So a couple things to think about on sort of the mental health uh, behavioral side of all this. Um, always, um, it partic always a good idea or almost, I think I always a good idea. To begin by contacting your health care provider, your primary care, if, if you don't have someone you're working with as a counselor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist or whoever, um, always think about calling your primary care physician, your own internist, your own OBGYN. My OBGYN is excellent. Sorry. Um, 
your child's pediatrician, always, almost always a good place to start. And people often neglect that step. Um, if people already, if people in your family already have mental health treatment in play, I'm hoping you've already been in touch with your mental health professional because most folks that I know are continuing to work and see patients. Most of them are doing it by so-called telehealth. So don't assume you can't have an interaction or contact with your mental health person. A lot of people are doing counseling sessions right now on Zoom and uh, similar technology. So uh, be sure to reach out as uh, on that and don't assume, you know, that it's not available. Um, so more about that in a minute. For parents, um, children and teenagers, for the most part, are, well, they're often, particularly young kids, are often going to mirror the emotions that they see in their families. And so one of our responsibilities, again, you'll never catch me saying this easy, is easy, is to really be careful about managing our own emotions when our kids are present. So when our kids are present, that's not a good time to fall apart. Um, our children are not the people to whom we should confide our anxieties and our worries and so forth. Um, so we need to um, be strong and reassuring for our kids. But some things to watch for in kids, um, excessive crying, um, you know, would be an obvious thing. Also know that when kids are um, worried and sad, this is true of children and teenagers, if they're worried, if they're sad, even if they're depressed, they often don't seem so much worried and sad to you as they do intensely irritable, like super grouchy. I don't, I'm not talking about garden variety, 15 year old grouchy. I'm talking about intense irritability. So always consider the possibility that when somebody is super irritable, that it really may be kind of masking some worry and anxiety and sadness that they have going on. Look for kids to kind of um, regress uh, to earlier behaviors. You know, they might start having toileting accidents, bedwetting, even though they've been past that. Uh, look for worry, look for sadness, look for changes in eating and sleeping habits. Um, looking, look for just kind of provocative acting out behavior, you know, um, difficulty with focusing. Um, I always think about stomach aches. Uh, stomach aches in kids, uh, if they haven't eaten just a really terrible enchilada um, and they have chronic stomach aches, they complain day in and day out of their stomach hurting or being upset. I, th I really think more often than not, that's more likely to be about worry and anxiety and something going on emotionally than something physically wrong with the stomach, you know? So I always think when I hear about a kid who complains frequently of stomach aches, I always think about anxiety, uh, worry, and, and depression uh, on that. Take me to, I think it's a good idea to not wait for your kids to bring up questions about, um, COVID-19, we probably ought to try to get ahead of that. At minimum, what we can do is say, do you have any questions for me about it? Would you like to talk about it? Is there anything you've heard that you want to bring up? Is there, uh, is there something you are worried about? And, um, you know, really good way to start. And sometimes kids will wave that off when you bring it up and then they'll come back around later and engage you in a conversation when they've had a time to sort of think about it. So answer questions, try to be honest, just make sure that our, we scale how honest, <laughs> we scale how open we are about the illness and all the danger based on the child's age. Obviously you'd have a very different conversation with a 16 year old than you would with a six year old. I, I really didn't, now having said, I think we should try to be honest. I think it's okay to reassure our kids that they're going to be okay. They're going to be safe. They're going to be taken care of, you know. Now, we know anything can happen. We know there are young people who get sick with this disease, and we've had some deaths of young people. But I still believe that um, it's, it's fine um, 
to to be reassuring. You know, it, it does. That doesn't mean you have to say there's no way you'll get sick. There's no there's no way daddy will get sick. You know, you, I, I don't think we should say that. I think we just should reassure kids that they are loved. They will be taken care of. They will be fine. And I think that's fair. I think that's a fair uh, compromise. Also, be careful uh, about your our kids access to this information on news media and in social media. Um, just like I was saying earlier, we all probably ought to put ourselves on a kind of a diet when it comes to news media. We need to make sure our kids aren't getting overexposed to the kind of information that's out there. I think it's really important with kids to try to keep them on a regular routine of get, getting up and going to bed at kind of fixed times, particularly with teenagers. There's this thing that teenagers do. Maybe you've noticed if you have a teenager, uh, this happens in the summer, um, is kids will, uh, teenagers will start rotating their sleep, sleeping later and later and later, staying up later and later and later, kind of rotating forward. Probably that's generally not a good thing. So you really ought to set a bedtime. Now, if it's an hour or an hour and a half later, than what would be typical on a school day when people are going to school. That's fine. That doesn't really matter. Just as long as you don't have kids sleep until 11 o'clock, you know, every morning. That's just not a good idea. So I try to stay away from that if, if, uh, if I could. Um, so try to maintain, uh, you know, kind of some kind of routines. Um, let me do this. Um, Jill Spiro, our communications director, is going to um, post um, on Facebook on, on this video as a comment. I'm not sure how she'll do it. She's really smart. She'll figure out a way. A set of resources that I just kind of put together. So these resources are like the crisis center where you can call 24 hours a day if somebody in your family is feeling depressed and maybe self-destructive. There's a they have a text-based system for teenagers where teenagers can text with a trained volunteer just to have somebody to talk to if they're feeling low. Uh, we've got like domestic violence uh, hotlines, one local program, and then a national program. Other kinds of resources that are uh, in place out there. So look for those. That uh, Jill, just check the. Prince of Peace um, Facebook page and Jill Spiro, or the, we'll, we'll show you how to look, look for those. Let me quickly see if we've got a question. Got a couple. All right, so tips particular to toddlers and their families. All right, so toddlers um, have, you know, a, strictly speaking, a toddler, uh, you know, is not, does not know what's going on. However, um, Toddlers are perfectly capable of picking of picking up on tension and stress and anxiety in their families. It's pre-verbal, you know. Um, so even though toddlers may have some language, they don't have the kind of language that receptively or expressively that allow you to have a conversation with them about coronavirus and COVID nineteen. But be aware. You always, if you're a betting person, you always want to bet on the idea that your young kids know more than you think they do. If they don't know it in a cognitive, intellectual way, they know it on an emotional way, in an emotional way. So they can pick up on the stress and the strain. So you might be tempted to think, oh, toddler, he's, he or she's fine. But don't assume that. A toddler may need more loving and cuddling and story time and attention. And you may well see um, behavioral and emotional changes in toddlers that might be confusing to you because you might think there's no way they can know what's going on, but they are picking up on the vibe, to use a technical term. I think that was you. <laughs> Sorry. So, so yeah, I, um, I, that's a general question, but but I think that's the main thing is to not, assume that toddlers, because they don't have the language to understand all this, are, are immune from the stress. Margaret reminded me, and thank you, I actually had this on the list. <clears throat> uh, 
The crisis center has what's called a senior line, the crisis center here in Birmingham. In fact, I referred someone just yesterday, no, last week, to the senior line. It's a little bit different from their other programs where like you call them if you're concerned about yourself or concerned. What they do is they have a list of uh, older people that they just call and just talk to. And so uh, it's a really great service. If you have uh, an old older family member, it's in a nursing home or in assisted living and they're kind of um, quarantined like the rest of us and you're worried about whether they have enough contact and you're calling them, but you're too busy to call them as much as you'd like to. I think the senior line is probably pretty overwhelmed right now, but still okay to look at the Crisis Center website. And I have this on the resource guide and get your older loved one or friend on the list. And hopefully at some point, someone will be able to get in touch with them. Thank you, Margaret. We're trying to keep this to 30 minutes. We're about there. I do I see some older questions. I think I've already covered. All right, I'm gonna stop. Uh, we'll do this again, maybe in about a week or so, or sooner if you want. Um, I do want to end with a prayer. I like to write prayers. Um, and so uh, let's do that. If you're so inclined, uh, uh, join me uh, in this prayer. Father, we bring our worries to you. We bring them and place them on the rock, which is your love for us. There we put our troubles. We seek your protection and guidance, your daily reminders that we should care for one another and that we will be your hand who feeds and cares for our brothers and sisters. We pray that in our families, we will be patient with each other, slow to anger, filled with compassion and understanding. Help us hold back our hand when we feel like striking. Help us to hold our tongues when we feel like saying something hurtful. We pray that you allow us to find the joy and delight in one another as we devote time together in our homes. We pray for the sick, all those who are afraid. We pray especially for all those who work to combat disease and care for the sick. We pray for all those in all lines of work who help us get our needs met. And we remain grateful daily for these and all your gifts. Amen. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time. Um, we may just try to, maybe we'll do this every week. I don't know. <laughs> we'll just keep your eye on the uh, Prince of Peace uh, Facebook page and we'll keep it posted. God bless everybody and uh, hang in there. Bye-bye.